be the light shining bright for all to see the love of Christ living light shining in you and me tell the world share his love so they can know the Holy One God the Son let it show be the light shining bright for all to see the love of Christ living light shining in you and me tell the world share his love so they can know the holy one god the son let it show now is the time to let your light shine oh, oh now is the time to let your light Please bow your heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so, so much. We come to you here on this ninth night, and coming to you to help us solve all our problems and bless us as we continue to work for you. Please give us your Holy Spirit as we continue to be missionaries for you. And thank you so, so, so much for your grace, purity, perfectness, and love and dying on the cross for our sins. In your name, amen. All right, good evening. And as was mentioned, welcome to our ninth session, our second to last day together. And I know it will be a rich blessing for each and every one of us. Wow, tomorrow's our last day. It went by quick, didn't it? It's like when something goes by so fast and at the same time goes by so slow. So anyways, I've been blessed to be here. I hope you're excited for tonight's presentation. As was mentioned, it is the newness of life. And we'll be talking about an important passage in Revelation and what it practically means for us today. And then we have our last two presentations tomorrow. Just a reminder, we do have a meeting at 11 a.m. if you're available in the morning. That's our second to last meeting. Then our final meeting will be at 7 p.m tomorrow evening uh, and you're not going to want to miss these presentations as we finish our seminar together with that being said let's pray one more time and we'll dive right in father bless us now as we study we ask that you would enlighten our minds and to speak to us lord in jesus name we pray amen, amen. all right newness of life let's go ahead and dive right in to this subject this evening revelation 7 14 15 is the key passage that we want to seek to understand the Bible says here, describing a special group of people, a very special group of people. It says here, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So here in Revelation, describing a very special group of people that enter into the very presence of God, that get to serve in the very presence of God, that they get to come into the temple before the very throne of God. How many of you want that job? Amen? Amen. I was like, you know, I think I told you on a previous night, you know, when it comes to the new earth, uh, the kingdom of heaven, I'm happy to be the janitor who stands at the front gate, right? If that's as far as I get, I would be satisfied. But here it's describing how people will actually enter into the very presence of God. And it says, because they have come out of great tribulation. Remember, this is the revelation of healing seminar we've talked about. Mental healing, emotional healing, physical healing, spiritual healing. These are the four major components that make up a person. And the Bible speaks to healing in all four of these parameters. This is what God desires. And often we need healing when we've gone through great tribulation and here it describes a special healing that occurred it says here that they went through this great tribulation but they did something they washed their robes now often in the bible you can ask the question is this literal is this uh is this symbolic and usually you can tell just by reading the context what's going on what color did they make their robes they made them white in the 
blood. Now, I don't know how, if you've ever bled before. You know, I, when I was a young boy, I felt like every other day, one of my brothers, and me or one of my brothers were bleeding for some reason. And blood doesn't typically turn things white. So we know here this is metaphorically describing something that there was blood that was shed that would allow the, the, these robes to be made white. Now, it's the blood of the who? The blood of the lamb. Now, who is the lamb? We talked about the lamb of God on a previous night. Who was the lamb of God? Jesus, that's right. And so this man named Jesus, the Lamb of God, it's his blood that can make you white again. And this is for those who have come out of great ah, tribulation. So what is it that brings ultimate healing? It is the blood of the Lamb of God. And so we're going to talk about this. What is this washing? What is this renewing? What is this language of garment? What's really going on here? The Bible speaks of, this, speaks of this in a number of places. Oh, my uh, clicker seems to be having a fun thing tonight. All right, let's keep going. So it speaks of this in a number of places. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is probably my favorite place where it speaks to this concept. It says here, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what, everybody? Yeah, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, how many things? Yeah. All things have become new. It's this beautiful idea that God doesn't, like, let me say it differently. The Bible is clear that God will accept anyone at just as they are, correct? But the beautiful thing the Bible teaches is God doesn't leave you the way you come to him. In other words, if you come broken, he's not going to leave you broken. He's going to want to heal you. If you come dirty, he doesn't want to leave you dirty. He wants to clean you. Like this is, He's in the business of holistic healing. This is what God is in the business of doing. And the Bible describes it this way, that all things, old things could pass away and all things can become new. This is such an encouraging thought. I shared on a previous night, I was an atheist who... Uh, became a believer in the Bible through a series of events. Opening night, I shared the science and philosophy of an intelligent designer. Uh, the second presentation, I shared the greatest evidence in favor of the inspiration of the Bible. How can we know with confidence that this is truly a special book? That out of all the gods of the world, how do we know that this is the God, the, the creator of the heaven and earth, is the God of this, bi the, this book called the Bible? And we talked about that evidence. Then we tackled some difficult questions uh, about this God, if God is love, why is there pain and suffering? So we kind of worked through these things. And this was part of my journey, part of my experience of, of going from a Dwayne evolutionist into a creationist, someone who actually believed in God. But when I came to believe in God, guess what I still had? All my baggage. Does that make sense? Even though I came to a new worldview, even though I came to a new understanding, it did not change the things that I had done. It do, didn't undo any crimes that I might have committed. It didn't change any hearts that I may have broken. It, it, it couldn't undo the things that I have done literally. Like those things are in the past. That's what they are. But then the Bible said that he can take all things and make them new. In other words, that the things of the past, you can come to a point where you can actually let it Go. And I don't know, if there's, if there's one thing that brings some mental healing, I think it's that beautiful concept. That in life, you can come to a point when you can let the past, you can let it go. And the Bible says here that he will make all things, all things new. Now, what exactly, what kind of newness does, does the Bible want us to have, to experience? The Bible says in 1 Peter 2.21, for to this you were called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his... Yeah. So if you're asked the question, where, where is the end goal? Where is the journey going? What is the path that, that the God of this book wants to carve out? It's actually quite simple. Just look at the life of Jesus, and that's the life that he wants for you. In fact, so much so, the Bible says it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, 
But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I want you to get this concept here. I have been crucified with Christ. What happens when you're crucified? Like what would happen to you literally if you were crucified? Yeah, you would die. It, it says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ what? Lives in me. So it's not just that God gave you an example to follow, but he's also describing how he wants to implant a power within you to execute the plan. Do you see that in the text? That it's not just, I mean, I'm sure that you've had this experience. I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I had this experience once, and it was kind of funny. I went to a gym. It was about the beginning of a year. I won't tell you what year it was. It wasn't that long ago, but I, you know, I went to the gym at the beginning of a particular year. And I, in order to get this bonus membership thing, you had to meet with a personal trainer. You know those guys? Personal trainer. And they're supposed to come up with this plan for you, this, this plan. I was like, okay. And I went, and they came up with the plan. And again, this was just all part of the free gimmick, so I can get into the gym for a couple of weeks for free. Anyways, and so he comes up with this plan, and it was a pretty intense plan. And I, but it looked exciting. I, you know, I, I was a sucker. I bought right into it, right? I was like, this looks, this looks like a good plan. So I, two days into the plan, though, I was so discouraged. It was so much work. And guess where that guy was? I have no idea. I never saw him again. All I know is I got into the plan. Two days into the plan, I realized this ain't going to work. See, he outlined a plan, but then he was nowhere nearby to help me with the plan. See, God is not like that. See, God not only gave you the plan, but what's the roadmap look like? The life of Jesus. To love like Jesus loved. To care like Jesus cared. To serve like Jesus served. This is the plan that I have for you. How am I going to execute the plan? I will be with you every step of the way. Christ in you. Isn't that a beautiful concept? So this is the idea. Romans says the whole thing differently. See, the Bible is written by different authors. Even though they're expressing the same thought, they're using different vocabulary to express the same thought. Romans 6, Paul says it this way. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. It's this beautiful idea that if we, if we, if we experience the likeness of his death, we'll experience the likeness of his... Yeah, that if we choose to have this experience, there's a promise of a resurrection day. And what is the experience? That the old man is to be... Crucified. Now, it's kind of interesting. Old man. That's not referring to your old man in, in the old man sense. Like my dad, I call him my old man, right? That's not what it's talking about. The old man here is the old person who you used to... Yeah. It's that old person, that, that person who is living life without God. That's the old man. And that old man is supposed to spiritually die. And when, if he dies, but you're still alive, that means you have a new what? You have a new life. And what does a new life look like? It's no longer a slave of... Ah, oh, we talked about this on the previous night, right? Isn't it so frustrating that the good that we want to do, we don't always seem to so easily do it. And the bad that we want to stop doing, it seems so difficult to stop. It's almost like our minds are slaves. It's almost like we can't even control our own thoughts at times. Don't raise your hands, but just think. Have you ever felt that way? It makes sense because according to the Bible, we're slaves of sin by nature. So if you're a slave, you need someone to come to set you. And that's what the Lamb of God offers. And he offers to set you free by causing a change in your life, a change to take place. John 3 describes the change this way. Again, all these passages, washing your robes, making them white, uh, a, a new creature in Christ, dying and resurrecting in Christ. All these are the same concepts spoken different ways. John 3 says it this way. 
Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I love Nicodemus. He's such a literalist, isn't he? I'm a literalist, so I can relate so much with Nicodemus. Jesus here is saying, you got to be born again. He's scratching his head. Can a grown man get back in the womb and come out again? That doesn't make any sense. Obviously, the answer is no. That's not what he's referring to. Then Jesus says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The Bible teaches that we have to become born again. Now, when you're born, you, you, start, your new, you start life, right? I mean, before you were born, you, you kind of weren't there, and then you're kind of there. I know that's like a philosophical, mind-blowing concept to think about, right? Good thing I don't remember. It'd be traumatizing. But you're born again means you're starting a new life. This is what Paul was saying, that you have to die and be resurrected. That's starting a new life. Uh, it said it the other way, you need to let go of the past. Old things need to go away and all things need to become new. Like all these concepts are all describing the same thing. What does it mean to be born again? It means to be a new creature, to come to a point where you can let the past go, to, for, to have Christ implanted within you that actually lives out the principles of love and selflessness through you. That this is the concept of what it means to have your robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. How many want your robes washed tonight? Amen? Amen. I want my robe washed. I want to be able to live that type of life that he lived. Now, when you look at these main thoughts here, whoops, I forgot to go there. You, what do we see? We looked at a few passages. We looked at a few things. See if my clicker will reach. There it is. Um, describing the overall experience, it's describing death, resurrection, water, and spirit. And again, all these authors were just talking about the same thing, but using different vocabulary, that when you put all this vocabulary together, it's describing a theological concept, a biblical concept, that is actually known as, there it is, baptism. Baptism. This idea of being born again, this idea of going into the water and being born of the spirit, of burying the old and coming out new, it is this biblical concept known as baptism. That's what the Bible calls the overall experience together, baptism. Baptism, there's an outward portion of baptism, an outward expression, but there's also an inward experience of baptism. And all put together, that is what is being described. So we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of baptism, because this is the idea of being washed and coming into the newness of life. All right. I may need someone to give me my... Uh, actually, let's see if this other clicker works. This clicker's not working for some reason. So let's see if this one works. And we'll go with the old one. All right. How important is this idea of baptism? So whenever it comes to any topic that we talk about here, our primary textbook has always been the Bible. Except for the first night, we use science and philosophy, correct? But outside of that first night of science and philosophy, since then, our textbook has been the Bible. So we want to answer this question of baptism. What exactly is baptism? How important is baptism? And what can we learn about it as it relates to us starting a new life? All right, the Bible says here in Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So here is this idea, this idea that when, before Jesus left this earth, when he spoke to his disciples, he gave them this concept, he gave them this idea to go and to teach everybody, teach everyone the things that he had taught them, but after they teach them, to go ahead and baptize them, to baptize them. This next text on the screen, it says Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19. That is incorrect. This is Mark 16, 16, if I remember my Bible correctly. This should say Mark chapter 16, verse 16. The Bible reads, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be 
condemned. Question, according to the Bible, from the text of Scripture, is baptism important, yes or no? Yeah, it's vitally important, this idea of being baptized, because it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So we at least know that it's something Jesus wanted us to do, to teach others the things that he taught, and then to baptize them. He then says in Mark 16, 16, that he who believes and is baptized, they shall be saved. So when we look to the Bible, can we see that it's important to baptize, yes or no? The idea is, is clear. Jesus told us to teach the people and to baptize them. But what exactly is baptism? Let's talk a little bit more about this concept from the Bible. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. The Bible said, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John and to Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. Then the Bible goes on to say, But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. So here you have John the Baptist baptizing people in the River Jordan. And who came to John? Jesus came to John. And he, what did he ask John to do to him? Did you know Jesus himself was baptized? And so here, remember, we saw earlier tonight that Jesus wants us to follow in his footsteps, right? And I love this beautiful idea that God, the God of the Bible never asks you to do something that he himself has not first done. That everything that he asks of you, he is first willing to give an example of what that looks like. And you can, you can if you have questions, you can, I can show you more examples from the Bible. He does this consistently because he's a good leader and good leaders lead by example. And I just love that about him. So here Jesus leads by example. He's baptized. And then it says this, and when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from where? The water. So we know baptism has something to do with, has something to do with water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighted upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So what descended upon him when he came out of the water? The, the, the spirit in the form of the dove. Remember what did John 3, 3 say? That if you're going to be born again, you have to be born of the water, outward expression, and of the spirit, inward work. It was describing this experience of baptism. So this is, again, Jesus gave us a beautiful example. Not only did he teach it was important, he demonstrated that he would do it himself. So what does the Bible teach about how we should be baptized, about how we should be baptized. There's a lot of different ideas out there about how to be baptized. There's sprinkling, there's pouring water. Yes, there's pouring olive oil, uh, submersing fully under the water, and doing nothing at all, just saying it was symbolic. So I actually did a, a quick search on the internet to see different forms of baptism. There's a Coca-Cola baptism, I'm not sure if you've seen that one. Um, there was the, the rock concert baptism. So what happens is you just get in the center and everyone opened up water bottles and just poured them on top of you in and, and, and the mosh pit type of a thing. And that was a baptism. And there was one where they had a high-powered water hose and mowed down the whole line of people. And that was their form of baptism. So in other words, when you look it up, people are baptizing in all kinds of different ways. So the question is, according to the Bible, what does baptism actually look like? Is that a fair question to ask? So that's what we want to look at next. What exactly is baptism? What does it actually look like? Well, the Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, and how many baptisms? Yeah, there's one baptism. And it's this idea that something needs to be washed. Something needs to be washed that it can be made white as snow. This is the beautiful idea. Now, the Bible gives us some ideas of the experience. Romans 6, describing, we read it earlier this chapter at least, says this about baptism. Therefore we were, what's that key word? Buried with him through baptism. So something about baptism, you have to be, got to be buried. 
into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of, yeah, the newness of life. So something about baptism is somehow cor correlated with the idea of being buried and coming up into the newness of, yeah, life. So when we think about baptism, we know it has to do with water. Now, obviously, this idea of being buried means you have to go underneath. So if you're buried in water, that means you're submerged completely under the, yeah, under the water. Story of a kid, right? He lived on a farm. And so this particular kid, um, they had chickens and goats and all kinds of other animals. And um, like it happens on a ranch, occasionally an animal dies for various reasons. So one of the chickens died. And they had just gone to church that day. And at church, uh, the, the preacher actually read Romans 6 before someone was baptized. But the passage said that the person needed to be buried. But then they sprinkled water on the person. And so then the kid asked the dad and said, well, the Bible said buried, but he sprinkled him. And the dad said, well, sprinkling is just as good as burying. The kid said, okay. Because when you're a kid and your dad says something, you just say, that's the way it is. So that day on the farm in the afternoon, a few hours later, the chicken's dead, right? So the dad's like, oh, the chicken's dead. It's so annoying. Okay, son, please take the chicken behind the barn and guess what? Bury the chicken. Okay. Kid goes, takes the chicken, disappears for a few minutes and comes back. And the dad's thinking, man, he came back really quickly. That ah, should be fine. Later on that night, the dad was taking out the trash. He was walking behind the barn and he tripped on something and fell on the ground. He said, what is on the ground? So he starts looking and realizes the chicken's right there on the ground. So he brought his son out there, and he was ready to discipline his boy. Brought him out there and said, son, you lied to me. He said, dad, I never lied to you. He said, you lied to me. He said, look at that chicken right there. Do you see the chicken? He said, I see the chicken. He said, you told me you buried the chicken. He said, but, I, but dad. He said, what? He said, you said sprinkling is just as good as burying. So I sprinkled some dirt on the chicken and left it there. Question, is, are they different or are they the same? Yeah, they're different, right? The Bible says that you have to be buried. This is why when Jesus was baptized, it actually says, and when, oops, sorry, I'm having a lot of clicker trouble tonight. When he had been baptized, Jesus came, what's that key word? Up immediately from the, yeah. Indicating where was he? He was down in the... Yeah. And this is what happened. This is what was going on. This is why the place John baptized, the Bible describes it as having much water there. Because you need enough water to actually cause someone to completely be submerged. That this is the biblical word or idea of baptism. And in fact, if you actually just take a look at the original language, baptizo is the Greek word for baptism that's trans transliterated into baptism. The Greek, the Greek word literally means to dip and su submerge. It's used in two ways, in two separate, in, in a variety of manuscripts, but it's used in two ways you might be familiar with. Who here likes pickles? Anyone like pickles? I like pickles. Oh, only a few of you, okay. Pickles. So what is a pickle before it's a pickle? It's a cucumber. How do you change a pickle into, or excuse me, how do you change a cucumber into a pickle? Well, you take a cucumber, you, you submerge it into a vinegary, liquidy substance, and eventually it becomes a, becomes a pickle. The Greek word for pickling is baptizo. You take the cucumber and you baptizo, and it comes out a pickle. Sounds funny, but it's, think about it. Think about it. It goes in one way, completely under, and then it comes out different. It's also used for dyeing cloth. So you would take, you'd make your dye, you would take your cloth, you would dip the cloth into the liquid dye, and you would be, the Greek word would be, you just, you baptizo that cloth, right? That's an English uh, form of that word. You baptize that cloth. It goes in one way, one color, but it comes out different after it's been fully submerged. The same word is used to describe what happens 
when someone who chooses to give their heart to Jesus goes under the water and comes up again. They're being baptizo. They're going in one way, but coming out as something different. Except that being on the outside, the difference is on the, on the inside. You got it. You got it. So that's what the word means. It, so, and, it, and therefore, it must involve submersion because the very word itself means to dip or submerge with the intent of something changing. That's what's going on here. It means to literally immerse something into the liquid. Now, there's an example of, uh, of someone being baptized in the Bible in Acts chapter 8. I think it'd be worth us looking at. In Acts 8, verse 35 to 38, the Bible says here, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? So here's a beautiful story of uh, of Philip and his Ethiopian eunuch. He comes across the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is He's reading a passage, the scroll of Isaiah, and then he asks, uh, you know, Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, I don't know, is this man talking about himself or someone else? And starting at that point, the, uh, Philip preached who to him? Jesus. He introduced him to the Lamb of God. He introduced him to the revelation of healing, Jesus himself. And as after he introduced him to Jesus, they saw some water, and the, the, the eunuch said, hey, look, there's water. What's preventing me from being baptized? The story continues. Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to, stop, to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch, notice what the text says, went down where? Into the water. And he baptized him. He submerged him. So again, it's this idea that baptism is to take someone, fully submerge them under, under the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as Matthew 28 said, and for them to come out and to walk in the newness of Life. It is symbolic that the old man is being buried and your experience resurrection into a new walk, a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a life committed to following Jesus, the Lamb of God. So where did these other methods come from? Obviously, aside from the Coca-Cola and some of the other ones that we won't get into, but the more legitimate ones, where did these other ones come from, like sprinkling? It was no ill intention, and it was no desire to be unbiblical by any respect of the imagination. It was good intended, I believe, good-hearted people. For example, it wasn't until the Council of Ravenna in AD 1311 that sprinkling was, and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. So it wasn't until years later when these were considered equally accepted. Now you may be thinking, well, why would that happen? Well, um, unlike modern day and modern age, when we baptize people today, sometimes we're privileged to get into something that feels more like a jacuzzi, amen? It's nice and it's warm water. Um, If you wanted to baptize someone in the winter in 1600, guess what you would lack? Warm water. And uh, sometimes for convenience, I believe it was for convenience that some of these other methods were actually introduced. Not because people were ill-intended, not because people were trying to intentionally be unbiblical, but it was because they were trying to find a a level of convenience when it came to baptizing people, particularly in the harsh months. I actually do believe that. Now, it does bring up a valid point, though. When we have to make a decision sometimes, sometimes in the Bible, when God says something— and he speaks something, we have to then ask, are we going to do it the way God has asked us? Are we going to do it our own way? And I'm going to suggest to you that when it comes to the Bible and God, we should always do it the way that he has asked us, because there's usually a very important reason why he's asked us to do it that particular way. But this is where the other's methods came from. Again, I'm not saying they're ill-intended, or people were ill-intended, or other uh, groups of people were ill-intended. I'm just saying it looked like it was for measure of convenience, which is no longer necessary. So let's get back to the biblical way of doing things. Amen? We can go to the next slide. Just going back and forth between these clickers. There we go. Galatians 3.27. So what happens at baptism? 
on the inside. The outside, you go underwater and you come out. But what actually happens to the heart? It says here, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, you, you actually take on the very name of Christ. Now, tell me, what other experience in life do you do where you take on someone else's name? Yeah, being baptized is actually like being married. But who are you being married to? The Lamb of God. And you're taking on his, his name. The Bible says you're literally putting on the name of the name of Christ, which is why people who follow Jesus are often called Christians. It's not an arbitrary term. It's because they're actually taking on the name of, of Christ. That's what the text says. And so with marriage, right? Uh, marriage, interesting, marriage, marriage. Um, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to marrying someone, I want you to, like, to think about marriage. Imagine if someone came to you. Now, if you're already married, obviously don't think about this part. But, you know, think about your own experience in the past, right? So if, imagine if someone came to you and wanted to, to, to marry you. And they came to you and said, you know, I just want you to know I love you. And I want to marry you. And you get excited. Oh, I want to marry you too. And they say, oh, great. I'm glad you want to marry me. But just so you know, I want to marry you in secret. I want to marry you, but I don't want anyone to know I'm married to you. Question, do you feel romantic anymore? Yeah, I can see some of your eyes right now. Like, there is no way he would survive that conversation, <laughs> right? I mean, you, would you feel special anymore? What would you think if someone said, I want to marry you, but I just don't want anyone to know. Can we keep marriage on the down low? Would you think that they're proud of you to be their significant other? No, you would, you would think, man, this person doesn't really, yeah, they don't really love me, Right? Now, when it comes to marriage, when you marry someone, do you wait until the day which you are perfect to marry someone? Do you wait until the day when you have zero faults in your life and you say, now I'm ready to get married? Those that, were, those that have been or are married, is that how that works? I see heads shaking. No, right? If you wait to the day when you're absolutely perfect to get married, guess what's probably going to happen in your life? Yeah, you're probably never going to get married, Right? Because marriage isn't a token of perfection, but it's a token of commitment. It's not saying you're absolutely perfect and I'm absolutely perfect, but it's saying even though we're still slightly imperfect, we are perfectly committed to each other. So I love the idea that being baptized is like being married because it draws some beautiful lessons with Jesus. You know, some people want to be married to Jesus, but they don't want the world to know. I did. I was an atheist becoming a Christian. I was studying the Bible for the first time. And one of my boys, Josh, I remember, he, he would say, hey, what are you doing tonight? You coming, you coming to drink with us tonight? And then in my mind, I'd be like, man, I'm, I'm studying the Bible tonight. But I kind of don't want to say I'm studying the Bible tonight. Like, I don't, oh, man, I'm tired, man. It's a long day, you know, 16-hour shift in the warehouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, but you normally would come out and drink anyways. Yeah, yeah, you know, I just, I just... Got some personal stuff to take care of. Oh, I got you. I got you, bro. He leaves, and I go home, and I study the Bible, right? And I'm just like, but it was like I didn't want anyone to, to know. And then one day I asked myself, I was like, wait, why am I so, why am I so embarrassed? Why am I so ashamed to be excited about the, the Bible? I realized I wanted to be married to Jesus, but I didn't want anyone to, to know. And I realized that, that's, that's, that's not how this should work. And I thought, Lord, help me. Help me to be able to come and to be willing to tell others because the Bible actually says, whoever confesses me before who? Before men. Him will I also confess before my, yeah, my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying, look, I, I love you, but you can't secretly marry me. It doesn't work like that. You can't be ashamed of me and yet love me. Like, you either love me or you, yeah, don't. Either you're with me or you're, or you're not. And he's saying, look, if you're going to be with me, there's got to be a public declaration. And when you're baptized, you're literally publicly declaring to everyone around you that you are choosing to follow who? To follow and take on the name of Jesus. You're, you're confessing him before men when you're baptized. And he says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. That he will say, oh, yeah, yeah, this one, I'm married to this one. This one, yeah, this, this, this person, we're committed to one another. 
This person's coming into the kingdom. I know them and they know, yeah, they know, we have a relationship. Father, we're cool. They're cool. They come in. That's what's going on here. So to summarize, the method and the meaning, right? It's this idea that the method is fully immersion, complete submersion within water by an individual. And the meaning of being fully put under the water is dying, being buried, uh, coming, resurrecting, coming up out of the water and into the newness of life. That is what the symbolism and the meaning is. In fact, there's a story of this. I knew the pastor of this, this person, and they said, hey, when you baptize me under the water, I want you to hold me down there for about a minute. The pastor said, excuse you? She, he said, yeah, I want you to hold me down there for about a minute. You know, I just wanted, I, I want to kind of, she said, I'm good at holding my breath. It'll be safe. I just want to hold my breath under the water for a little while and just kind of like have that symbolism of, wow, I am buried. Like, I am truly giving the old person away. And she's like, I want to say a prayer under the water that the old person can stay there and that God can really change my heart and make me a new person when I come up. And it was such a beautiful story, such a beautiful symbolism. And that's what is going on here, the method and the meaning. Now, like anything, like marriage, I should say, there are certain requirements. You may be saying, wait, requirements? Requirements? What do you mean requirements? Things that should happen? Well, yeah, of course. You don't just walk down the street and meet some person and say, you know, hi, what's your name? And they say, my name's Bob. And you're like, Bob, pleasure to meet you. We should get married tonight. Well, that, that usually wouldn't go very well, right? I mean, maybe Bob might be intrigued, but that, that probably is not going to end up being a very solid marriage or you have those programs i don't know if they still play my mom used to watch this back in the day um uh, the bachelor or something like that it's like the guy with the girls and at the end he picks the girl but they really don't even know each other and i remember i just did some research some stats this is only a few weeks ago how many of these people end up divorced afterwards and the majority ended up divorced because they really didn't even it, we didn't know each other. It, it wasn't a genuine love and experience that they had with one another. It was just a gimmick, a show, or whatever, right? S just like marriage, there are certain steps you kind of go through before you make the decision to get married. There are certain things that the Bible talks about as people before they make that full-fledged commitment. One of the examples is repentance, right? The Bible says, uh, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized. But notice, what came before baptism? repentance, right? It says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, repentance we talked about on a previous night. How do you get repentance? Well, it's quite simple. You just behold the goodness of God, amen? You behold the fact that Jesus died for your sins. And repentance is when you actually feel sorry for those sins. You feel the, you, when you recognize, wow, my sin hurts Jesus. Like my sin crucifies Jesus. Like my sin breaks the heart of God and that makes me feel sad. Like I don't like that feeling of what my sins do to Jesus. That, that experience of feeling sad for your sins is what we call repentance. And usually when you're sad for the thing you're doing, you choose to want to stop doing that very thing. So it's this idea that you've spent some time with Jesus. You spent some time learning about him dying for you. You spent some time, which we did in these seminars, right? Learning what the Lamb of God has done so that you can have a sorrow for sin. Number two is to believe. To believe, right? Acts 19.4, then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Jesus Christ. So John the baptism, Baptist, excuse me, is baptizing those who chose to believe, which makes sense. If you're going to be committed to Jesus, you should probably believe that he is who he claims to be. Doesn't that just make logical sense, right? So we talked about Jesus on a previous night, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice he made, all that he gave for you and for me. If you believe that that is exactly who he was and what he accomplished, you qualify for number two. So if you made it to session three, we've already covered the first two. But it's not just believing, it's also a level of understanding. A level of understanding, right? The Bible said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, and then what do you do? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So before baptizing, what are you supposed to do? 
Yeah, you're supposed to teach. Well, that makes sense because God wants you to have a basic understanding of what you're committing to. Just like hopefully you have a basic understanding of the person you're choosing to get married to. And so the Bible's not making it complex by any stretch of the imagination. It's saying, number one, you should believe Jesus is who he claimed to be. Uh, Number two, it's saying you should at least have learned some of what the Bible teaches and be committed to the teachings of the Bible. And number three, you should experience to some degree some sorrow for your sin and appreciation for the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf. So if you believe that he is who he claims to be, and if you've learned some things about his teachings from the Bible and have enjoyed learning from him, and you have seen the sacrifice he's made for you in the Bible and have come to appreciate that great sacrifice, according to the Bible, you may be, you may be baptized. Repent, believe, and understand. Now, I get asked this question a lot. Uh, what about baptizing babies? Uh, some people are really excited about baptism and they want to baptize their babies. And I think that's such a beautiful, precious thought. Jesus loves the children, amen? Jesus said, don't prevent the children from coming unto me. But if we just look at our basic qualifiers of, 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 of a baby being baptized, and uh, the basic qualifiers are here, that they have sorrow and understanding of what Jesus did for them, that they believe Jesus is who he's claiming to be, and they understand some basic teachings of the Bible. Question, can a baby do those three things? No, they can't. And so, therefore, biblically, a baby should not be baptized. Now, in the Bible, you can do something else. You can dedicate a baby. Amen? Amen. People dedicate their children in the, Bi- in the Bible. They take their babies and they dedicate them to the Lord and say, Lord, we will raise this child in the fear and the name of the Lord. But when the child is old enough to make their own decision, ooh, their own what? I know as a parent, that's scary, isn't it? Children making their own decisions, have mercy. But isn't that what God does for with us, right? We're really just his children making our own decisions, and that's how it should be. When your child is old enough to make their own decision, then they can choose to marry Jesus or not marry Jesus. Amen? And that's how it should B, we shouldn't force babies to marry someone that they don't even know yet. We should let them grow up, gain understanding, and choose Jesus for themselves. Number two, next thing, what about being baptized again? The second most common question I've been asked by individuals when it comes to the subject, saying, I've been baptized before. Is there ever a reason when you should be baptized a second or a third time? Well, the Bible actually has a story that teaches us about this. It's in Acts 19, 1 through 5. It says here, and it happened... While Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, wait, finding some what? Disciples. Now, a disciple means they already followed who? Yeah, these are already, they're already believers in God and they're followers. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a... Holy Spirit. So it's kind of this weird conversation. You're you're bumping into some other people who are disciples, some other followers, and you're like, ah, disciples, great. Hey, did you receive the Spirit? And they're looking at you scratching their head, but we we never heard that teaching. We don't know about that one yet. So what happens? And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And so they said, into whose baptism? Yeah, John the Baptist, John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized you with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him that is on Jesus Christ. So he says, hey, so were you baptized? Yeah, we're baptized by John. Okay, but you don't know these things. No, we don't know these things. And he taught them the things that they did not, that they did not know. And after he taught them the things that they did not know, the Bible says, when they heard this, they were, yeah, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Question, were they already baptized before, yes or no? Yes, they were. Was it a good baptism that they were baptized into? Yeah, because was it good enough for Jesus' baptism himself? Yeah, same guy, right? So it was a good baptism. But through life, they came to a point when they learned something new, something that they did not know before. And it was a life-changing truth that they learned. And when they learned this life-changing truth, they chose to get baptized for a second time. So the Bible teaches me 
that there are occasions when someone may choose to actually be rebaptized. To summarize it, if you have learned more knowledge and gained a deeper experience with Christ, that very well may be a good reason to choose to get rebaptized. So, what happened in Acts 19? So, what happened in Acts 19? A second reason might be, aside from learning something new and changing your life, is I've met a lot of people on their journey at these types of seminars who have actually walked away from God at one point or another, for whatever reason. And they know that their heart was away from God. And for some reason, now they've come back to God. And they want to start that relationship afresh all over again. And the former baptism no longer satisfies for some reason, whatever reason that might be, if for whatever reason the former baptism does not satisfy, whether you wandered from God or your heart was never in it or you did it because your parents made you do it, for whatever the case may be, you can choose to actually be rebaptized for yourself and to start fresh all over again. See, I was an atheist most of my life, but most people don't know this. I was actually baptized as a kid, even though I was an atheist. I know, contradictory, right? It's okay. It happens. So what ended up happening was I went to a pool party, right, with some friends. And at this pool party, there was a guy that came over with the white robe on, and we all swam under this bridge in front of him, and he said something and pushed our heads under the water. I found out later I got baptized. I didn't even know I got baptized. I literally swam. The guy said some words, pushed me under, and I was baptized right there in the name of the Lord as an atheist swimming in the pool. And I was like, wait, what just happened? And I should tell my parents about this, right? <laughs> And so I didn't realize that, so technically, was I baptized? I mean, technically, I was baptized. I was submerged in the water by someone who said the right words. But question, did, was I committed to Jesus myself? Was it a decision I made for myself? Was it a decision that I was all in, like the wedding ring on my hand and the wedding ring on the hand? No. It was just something that just happened to happen for a reason, but my heart wasn't in it. And then I went to live a life very contradictory to the Bible anyways. So when I, as an adult, became a Christian, when I was in college and started finding Jesus in the Bible for the first time, when I eventually came to the question, they said, have you ever been baptized? I was like, actually, ironically, I have been baptized. And they're like, how? And I told them the story. And they're like, okay, well, if that works for you, and I told them. No one told me. I just told them. I said, no, that does not work for me. I was like, a forced marriage is not something I'm looking forward to with God. I want to make the decision for myself. And so I actually was rebaptized. So I do believe that someone may choose to be rebaptized. I myself was rebaptized. Is, a bapti- is baptism a requirement? Well, all I can read is what the Bible says. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, we do know that we serve a rational God, right? The God of the Bible is one who says, come, let us reason. Good, you remember, I heard it from like three or four people. Good job. Come, let us reason together. So there was a story of the thief on the cross. You might remember the thief on the cross. He was hanging on the cross next to Jesus. He looked at Jesus and said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He repented. Jesus looked at him and said, I promise you today, giving you the promise right now, that one day you will be with me in my kingdom, in paradise. God is an understanding, rational God. Could the thief take the nails out, jump off the cross, go get baptized, come back, get back on the cross, and then die? No, he could not do that, right? That was something he could not do. So when, when the Bible says he who believes and is baptized will be saved, understand that that's coming from a God of reason, amen? That if for whatever reason, you may know someone who loved Jesus, and you're thinking to yourself, wait, but they were sprinkled, not immersed. Are they lost? No, the answer is no. I believe that they can very well and probably are saved, amen? Because that was something that they just did not know. And I think we do serve a very understanding God. The difference for us here tonight is we've seen the text from the scriptures ourselves. So we cannot say that we did not know. We know now, but others may not have known. That's okay for them. Amen? So don't have any concern or worry for anyone who may have passed away who wasn't fully immersed. God understands. God has his own walk with them. I believe that God will do everything he can to get everyone he can into the kingdom. Amen? But for us tonight, this is something that we do have to ask ourselves. 
since we have that knowledge and we do know. Jesus wants to take our darkest sins and literally make them white as snow. No matter how much you've messed up, no matter how deep your sins are, no matter how dark your, your past may be, nothing is too dark that Jesus' blood cannot change. The Bible says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a, a new thing. You see, when you're driving a car, you have a window and you have a mirror. And yes, it's important to occasionally look in the mirror to see what's behind you. But what's most important? Staring at that windshield. It's more important to look ahead than to keep your eyes behind. Too often we look back at our mistakes. We look back at our failures. We look back at all the trips, the stumbles. We think, man, I started so strong and I left Jesus. I left God for so many years. And now that I'm coming back, I just can't stop looking in the mirror. Don't do that. When you look in the mirror the whole time, you crash the car. Amen? Learn to not look in the mirror behind, but look out the windshield before to the new thing that God has in store. In other words, he says, old things have passed away. We have to just let it go into the hands of Jesus himself and let his blood wash away all those mistakes and failures and shortcomings and sins and just to cover that in his blood and to accept the truth that today I'm starting a new chapter, a blank sheet of paper. I'm staring out the window and this car, it's moving forward. Amen? Amen. This is the experience God wants for each one of us. This is the experience that I had when I was baptized. Rebaptize, I should say. I'd studied the Bible for a number of months, and I'd finally come to the point when I made the decision, this is me, Gary, Pastor Gary Mufas. This was the pastor, for those that were here the night when I talked about my, the change in my language, and I was at someone's house, who his wife cooked me food. Yeah, it was his wife, right? <laughs> so that's the man who was very patient with me, a very understanding, a very kind man. And, and brothers and sisters, you need to understand that when someone gets baptized and gives their heart to Jesus, they're going to make a lot of mistakes. Amen. Babies stumble. Babies fall. I don't know if you've ever fed a baby. They vomit all over you after you feed them, right? It's a very disgusting phenomenon, but it happens. I've experienced it myself. You have to understand that if someone's a baby Christian, you can't expect them to live like they're a 35-year-old Christian. Amen? This man was gifted at that. And because he was so gifted at being understanding and working with me, I was able to come to the point when I was able to go into the water and to come out a new person. In fact, before I was baptized, everyone called me Tony. That was what I went by. That was a short version of my name. Everyone called me Tony. No one in my life ever called me Anthony. But once I came out of the water and uh, Pastor Gary hugged me, he said, I'm so happy for you, Tony. I said, I'm not Tony anymore. He said, you can call me Anthony, actually. He said, Tony died today. Tony stayed in the water. Call me Anthony. And I thought, hey, if Saul can change his name to Paul, I can change my name to, from Tony to Anthony, right? <laughs> and there it was. A new experience, a new life. And guess what? I chose not to do it in secret. I chose not to hide it. I chose to do it in front of my family. Some of them honestly didn't fully understand. This brother thought I was a fool. Look at his face. You can see it on his face. He literally thought I was a fool. Look at this fool in the water. This is, this is one of my drinking buddies. Look at him. He's like, man, there he goes. Man, we lost him. We lost him. He's gone. Like, it looked like I got executed. I, I, I'm not entirely sure what my mom was thinking. He looked kind of happy, actually. I was kind of surprised. My dad looked kind of happy there. It's kind of nice to see that experience. And that's my oldest brother in the back right there. He also wasn't too excited about it. But, but, but they came. Amen? They came. They came out. And I, it was important to me that I didn't do this in secret. I couldn't choose God in secret. I needed to confess him before men. And something happened on that day. There was a party. There was a party. Not the kind you're thinking of. The Bible says in Luke 15, 7 and 10, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in, in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You see, when someone gives their heart to Jesus, when they repent from their former life, when they go into the water and come out, there is actually a party that takes place. And that party takes place in heaven. Amen? Every time someone makes that decision to give their heart fully and entirely to Jesus, heaven literally throws a party. I know, we think it's so solemn up there, don't we? Now, they got some serious emotions up there. 
And I guarantee if anyone knows how to have a good time, it's the angels around the tree of life. Amen? And so they literally threw a party that day for me because I came to a point finally in my life when I can choose to follow Jesus. And I'll tell you, it was a big choice. I ain't going to lie. That was a huge choice. Atheist most of my life. I, I, I enjoyed the party scene. I enjoyed the street racing scene. I enjoyed the foolishness scene. enjoyed the fighting scene. I was a cage fighter for a little while there. I enjoyed those things for the longest time. And when I came to know Jesus and experience Jesus, I realized a lot of the things that I was doing, if I let Jesus in my life over time, those, some things were going to start to change. But I can tell you what, looking back, I couldn't have made a better choice. I have more, more fun now. Life is more fulfilling now. I have more peace and I've experienced way more healing in my life, connecting myself with the revelation of healing than I ever could have on my own. Now the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Acts twenty two sixteen, and why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. See, the Bible paints the picture that today's the day. Now is the day. And then it asks the logical question. Why wait? Why wait? Arise, get up, be baptized, wash away the old, and experience the new. At this time, we're going to be receiving a card. If we can pass those cards out, we have a couple of my friends here going to pass out a couple of cards for you. We're going to do something special tonight, and I, I made a commitment to to God a long time ago when I started doing these presentations back in 2010 that every time I did a seminar I would share about the newness of life and I'd always pass out this card to give everyone a decision the opportunity to make a choice I think it's very important to give everyone an opportunity to make this choice for themselves I don't know who you are I know some of your names amen. but I don't know who you really are I don't know what your life has been like I don't know the experiences you've gone through I don't know all these things. And so I want to at least give everyone the opportunity to make this choice. As you receive the card, I want you to look at it. I want you to pray over the things that it says. And we'll talk about what it says in a moment. If I can get one of those cards delivered up here. And I want you to pray and think about what the card says as we hear the first line of our song.
the people, the vast majority of people refuse to get into the ark. They refuse to hear the voice of God. They refuse to follow. They believe things would just go on as normal. But sadly, seven days later, the door closed. Or the door closed, excuse me. And seven days later, the rain began to fall. The waters began to rise. And people realized that God actually meant what he said. Like the evidences that he gives. Remember, God is not arbitrary and God is not out there left field, right? God is logical and rational. He literally laid down the evidence so that you can make the best decision the evidence and as a result the waters filled that world in Genesis 6 and 7 you can read the story until there was nothing left but those who were in the ark those who were in the boat and the crazy thing is I'm sure it was scary in that boat I'm sure it was hard to be in that boat surrounded by a water world but the reality was that God was with them God will preserve you through your personal tribulations if you would just get in to the boat Back then, it was a literal boat. Today, the boat has a name, and his name is Jesus. To come and to experience Jesus for yourselves. If you're looking at your cards tonight, there are five decisions I put on this card. Five things for you to pray, to, to reason. Come, and come, my, my friend. You've been coming night after night. Let's reason together for just a few more minutes. Question one, decision one that I want to surrender my life completely to Jesus and His truth. You've been coming night after night. We've been reading the Bible. I've laid the foundation for the existence of God and the trustworthiness and inspiration of the Bible. And we've learned some of the truths. And I've had conversations. I know you've been touched. I know you've been blessed. I know some of you have been amazed by the things that you're learning. If you've come to a point that you're saying, man, I know I'm not perfect, but I kind of want to be committed to this person, Jesus, all you have to do is put a check next to number one. That's all that one is saying is, man, I really come to appreciate this person, Jesus, and I want to choose to follow him. There's pins in the pews right in front of you or in the chairs. If you need a pen, go ahead and check number one. Number two says, I love Jesus and desire to be baptized soon. We learned tonight that baptism is going into the water, being buried and letting the old go and coming up and walking in the new. It's saying, I want to marry Jesus. Not because I'm perfect, not because I'm exactly how I probably should be, but because I'm committed to this person. I just want to be committed to Jesus, 100%, to follow whatever the Bible has to say. I want to commit to him. If that's you, if you want to commit to Jesus and you want to publicly declare that decision in baptism, check number two. Number three, maybe you've been baptized before like me. But for some reason, whether it's because of new insights, whether it's because of new things you've learned, or whether it's because you've wandered far from the Lord and are coming back to Him again, and you want to recommit to Him, if that's you, don't hesitate and don't be ashamed. I wasn't ashamed. Don't be ashamed to check number three if that's you tonight. Number four, I have learned new insights and would like to continue weekly Bible studies. I know some people, this is brand new. We all come from different places. Some of us have been studying the Bible for years. Some of us have been studying it for weeks. Some of us have never opened it until we stepped foot into this room and started these seminars. I'm glad all of you came, amen? And maybe you're at that point saying, wow, like I've enjoyed this, I've loved this, it's been exciting, I've learned some new things. I'm not ready to be baptized, but I definitely would love to continue learning what the Bible has to say. Please sign me up for some weekly Bible studies. Once a week, I would love to meet with someone and study the Bible to continue to dig deep and to learn for myself what the Bible has to say. And last, number five, if you have more questions about baptism, maybe you have more questions that weren't answered in the presentation tonight, and you would like those questions to be answered before you can make your decision, I want you to check number five. Whichever one you check tonight, I hope we all can check a box for Jesus tonight. Let's hear the second line to that song as we continue to pray about the decision that we want to make tonight. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you?
mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home. You are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling the sinner. but you didn't you check something else but if you would like to check baptism or rebaptism the bible said if you confess me before men i will confess you before my father i actually want to give you the opportunity to stand up and to come forward so i can say a special prayer for you and i know that's a big thing to ask trust me but if jesus can if that's yeah, praise the Lord, brother. Come forward. Praise God. It's always easy once one person makes a decision. Amen. Praise God for your decision tonight. I was gonna about to say, I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy, especially to be the first to come forward. But if Jesus can walk down Calvary for you, you can walk down an aisle for him. Amen. Praise God for your decision, brother. Praise God. Praise God for these decisions. Choosing to give their hearts to Jesus afresh or for the first time. They want to confess God before men. Is there anyone who wants to come and join them? To come and stand with them? And for those who have made this decision or are walking with the Lord, you should be praying right now. Amen? And if there's anyone else, don't be ashamed. And don't be afraid. We're all friends here tonight. But if you would like to make that decision and to come join, join my two friends up here, come up as we sing the third line of this song.
that it would be something that they would never turn back from, that they would never look back, and that they would follow the Lamb of God wherever He goes. In Jesus' name. special prayer and just meet both of you guys. So thank you so much for coming in. Is that a blessing? Amen. We always have to give the opportunity because we never know where people are at. We never know where they're at on the journey and it's never a shame to come forward and to stand for Jesus either the first time or to do it all over again. Amen. And as you leave, we're going to have friends. If I can have some of my uh, Souls West students standing, someone at each door, uh, they will actually collect your cards, and we're going to pray for you all by name as we get those cards and pray over your individual decisions that you made. We know there were other decisions on the card, and so we want to know what those were so we can pray for you and follow up with you and help you with any of the questions that are decisions that you made yourself personally. I hope you were each blessed tonight by tonight's presentation. Tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., we have a presentation, Israel versus Babylon. You're not going to want to miss it as we dig deeper into the, the second angel of the three angels of the book of Revelation. And then we're going to finish bringing a home at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening with no looking back. You've come this far on this journey. Don't ever go back now. Amen. Thank you for coming to the Revelation of Healing Seminar. We'll see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. and tomorrow at 7 p.m. God bless. Drive safe.